Joy Bomb with Sister Indica presents Blazed All Our Lives, The Ghost of Lily Banks. Welcome to Misty River, an affluent American mountain tarn filled with secrets and scandal. Our story begins at Sister Indica's mansion a few months after her infamous Christmas soiree. The entire fiasco had been broadcast live thanks to reporter Tiffany Fontaine's coverage, so all of Misty River witnessed her relationship with Seymour falling apart as well as Joanne Michaels killing Lily Banks. The local tabloids raked Sister Indica through the coals. She couldn't turn on a TV or see a paper without being reminded that her fiancé was not only secretly gay and having an affair with her houseboy, but they were both plotting to steal her fortune and her media empire. She was inconsolable. She took a leave of absence from her duties as co-president and CEO of Rognan Productions, reluctantly leaving the company in the hands of her new partner. She wished her stockholders dead for stabbing her in the back by selling all their shares to her nemesis, Rosie Bush. After spending weeks in bed, she was finally coaxed back into the land of the living by her best friends. Pandora Destranger and Giovanni Valducci. They convinced her that the best way to heal was to do some good for the world. But what? Finally, it hit her. She would invest in a total renovation and expansion of St. Nora's Orphanage, where Lily Banks used to be headmistress. She dove headfirst into planning the poshest black tie affair money could buy. Today we find our heroine in the drawing room of her mansion just hours before the ribbon cutting ceremony mixing her signature drink a vodka soda. <sighs> this one's for you, Lily. I wish you could be here for this party. I know you'd be so happy with all the changes we're making to St. Nora's. I should have done it while you were here, but I was you know, so consumed with Seymour, Rogue Nun Productions, and myself... What else is new? My ambition blinded me, and so did my hormones. But those days are over. Your death has given me a new lease on life, and this time, I'm not going to fuck it up. I'm a strong, independent woman, and I've learned that success only means something if you can use it to help other people. I'm going to make you proud of me, Lily. You'll see. Sister Indica sipped her cocktail and turned on the television. The Natalie Winter Show was about to start. Sister Indica hadn't missed an episode since Natalie made her a regular topic of conversation following the debacle that was her Christmas soiree. Let's see what the stupid bitch has to say about me now. Hello, Misty River. You're watching the Natalie Winter Show with me, Natalie Winter. Today's show is going to be a good one. I'm joined by my very special surprise guest, co-president of media giant Rogue Nun Productions, the indelible Rosie Bush. Are you fucking kidding me? Let's bring her out here. Come on, Rosie. A thinner, younger-looking, and very sharply dressed Rosie Bush walked onto the set to enthusiastic applause. Sister Indica couldn't believe her eyes. Liposuction, facelift, stylist, wig. Rosie, thank you so much for being on the show today. You look amazing. Natalie, thank you for having me. I feel amazing. Running a half-billion-dollar media empire certainly agrees with you, doesn't it? <laughs> How is life at Rogue Nun these days? It's amazing, Natalie. We've acquired some really great talent, and profits are now through the roof. You could say I'd taken a sow's ear and turned it into a silk purse. Just as I promised the day I became co-president. I like to keep my promises. 
You've done such an amazing job, Rosie. Are the rumors true about Sister Indica's impending return? Do you think her involvement will undo all the success you've achieved while she's been hiding away? What? I mean, I don't know a nicer way to say she's been crippled by humiliation and afraid to show her face around town, but can you blame her? Eat shit, Natalie. Natalie, the rumors are true, but Rognan is on such a great new path that not even the blundering Sister Indica could ruin it. Well, not with me around. Oh, fuck off. It's my company. I built it from nothing. You inherited greatness, bitch. It's no secret that you two aren't exactly friends. Does Sister Indica have any friends? <laughs> Are you concerned about working so closely with someone you once described as a garbage bag in a turban? Natalie, I'm a professional, and I think you're the one who called her that. We all just thought it. But Rognan's success is my top priority. So if Sister Indica acts like Sister Indica, I'll just take out the trash. <laughs> Overcome with rage. Sister Indica threw her glass of vodka at the television, shattering the screen, sparks and glass raining down. I'm gonna get my company back if it's the last thing I do. I'm coming back with a vengeance. I won't rest until I have your head on a platter. Rosie Bush, this is war. Sister Indica, dressed in her finest couture and wrapped in black mink, strode dramatically through the front doors of St. Nora's orphanage, her eyes searching the room for Pandora and Giovanni. She found them in conversation with Greta Schumacher, the orphanage's new headmistress. Hey, everyone. Greta, I trust you like what my staff has done with the place. Oh, yes, sister. The decorations are absolutely beautiful. And the outfits you selected for the children look like they cost a fortune. You really outdid yourself. Lily would be proud. She always spoke so highly of you. That's because Sister Indica's always high. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pandora, you're terrible. Sister, I can't thank you enough for all you're doing for St. Nora's. This renovation and expansion are going to make a huge difference in the lives of a lot of children. Greta, I live to serve, but if you'll excuse me, I need to steal these two away for a moment. You got it, sister. I still have a lot to do before the ceremony begins. Once Greta was out of earshot, Sister Indica exhaled a sigh of relief. How you holding up, sis? <sighs> I'm a wreck, but I'm definitely better. I know it's been months since Lily died, but it feels so weird being here without her. You may not be able to see her anymore, but trust me, she's always with you. Right here. Pandora placed her hand on the locket Sister Indica was wearing, which fell between her ample bosom. It was the same locket that Lily Banks had given Sister Indica the day she died. Pandora felt a sudden surge of electricity flowing into her. Images flashed before her eyes, too quickly for her to make out clearly what they were. Her knees buckled and she felt light-headed. My tits? She's in my tits? I think we both know the only thing in there is silicone. Oh, my God. That was the strangest thing. I felt like I stuck a fork in a light socket. Are those silicone or plutonium? Are you sure you ain't got radioactive titties, bitch? Pandora, you don't look well. Let me grab you a chair. Can I get you some water? No, thanks, Gio. I got this. Pandora retrieved a flask from her purse and emptied it into her mouth in one gulp. My God, you're shaking. Should we take you to see Dr. Banks? No, I'll be okay. Now stop focusing on me and get back to what's important. This event. I'm glad to see you all dolled up and ready to change some lives. I couldn't stand seeing you laid up in that bed all day. Depressed Sister Indica is a drag. It's good to have you back, bitch. Well, I wouldn't be back if it wasn't for you two. Pandora, my dearest friend, and Gio, I, I guess you're my little brother now. I still can't believe that Lily Banks was our biological mother. I feel like my entire life has been one big lie. I have so many questions. Questions we'll probably never get answers to now that Lily's gone. I haven't told a soul either. 
Do you think it's best that we keep it quiet until we find out more? I think you have the right idea, Gio. There's no need to freak everyone out just yet. I mean, what would I even say? Hey, Lily Banks told me she was my mom and Gio was my brother while she lay dying in my arms. Like, what if it was all some pre-death hallucination? She did say all would be revealed in time, whatever the hell that means. Hey, didn't Lily give you that locket? What if what happened to Pandora was a sign of some kind? Like, what if she's trying to contact us? He does make a lot of sense, sis. Pandora, I love you, but you know how I feel about all that otherworldly shit. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in the afterlife. When you die, you die. You're gone. That's it. This is something we've always had to agree to disagree on. I'm not going to try and convince you or anything, but I know what I know, and I am confident there is life after death. Pandora stood up, her legs still a bit shaky. I'll be right back. I'm going to go powder my nose. I think you hurt her feelings. Do you think she'll be all right? Oh, Pandora will be fine. We've had this argument for years. I think she just has low blood sugar or something. She probably just needs to have dinner. Vodka doesn't exactly fill you up. Mmm, speaking of, my father wants you to come to the mansion for dinner tomorrow night. He's returning from my grandfather's villa and wants to show you his appreciation. You know, for everything you've done for me and our family. (laughs) That sounds more like a summoning than an invitation. Well, he don't take no for an answer. (sighs) I have been away from the world long enough. It's time I was social again. Plus, I'll need a fun night out after spending the day back at Rogue Nun Productions with Rosie Bush. Let Vincenzo know I accept his invitation. How fancy is this dinner going to be, anyway? Should I wear panties? Giovanni laughed and shook his head. Pandora returned from the powder room, ashen-faced. Pandora, you don't look well. I'm calling Dante. Girl, I don't feel too good either. Yeah, please call Dante. He should be at the bookstore. While Pandora sat down to collect herself, a sister indica called Dante Fox, general manager of Destrangé's bookstore, and Pandora's dear friend. Dante's on his way. He'll be here shortly. Sister indica and Giovanni sat with Pandora until he arrived. The tall, olive-skinned and strangely attractive Dante Fox hurried over to Pandora as soon as he spotted her. I got here as fast as I could. Come on, lady, let's get you home. Thank God you're here. Help me up. Dante helped Pandora to her feet. She got her footing and then embraced Sister Indica. Good luck tonight, girl. I know you'll make Lily proud. As the women ended their embrace, Pandora grazed her hand against Sister Indica's locket by mistake. That same electric shock surged through her. This time the intensity increased tenfold. Her eyes rolled back in her head and she fell to the ground, barely conscious. A small crowd formed around her, everyone fearing the worst. Dante scooped her up in his arms. She's going to be okay. Giovanni, help me get her to the car. Sister Indica stood by helplessly as Dante and Giovanni carried Pandora outside. Was Giovanni right? Was Lily Banks sending her a sign from beyond the grave? Or was Pandora gravely ill? She couldn't bear the thought of losing her dearest friend. But she didn't have much time for overthinking. The ribbon-cutting ceremony was set to begin. As soon as Rosie Bush wrapped her appearance on the Natalie Winter Show, she had her driver take her straight to the Misty River Police Department. It had been months since Joanne was arrested, and her life without her was simply unbearable. She needed to do whatever she could to convince them to release Joanne to her custody so that Rosie's life could return to normal, whatever that looked like. Sure... Her professional life was going gangbusters, but on a personal level she was dying inside. Joanne was her much-needed counterbalance, the one who kept her level. She allowed enough time to pass before heading over to police headquarters to plead her case to Detective Jim Brinkman, who also happened to be her high school sweetheart. Would the love they shared years ago be enough to convince him? 
or would she need to use more cunning tactics? She marched confidently into his office and seated herself at his desk. Excuse me, lady, but that seat's taken. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jim. I must have gotten confused. Rosie stood up and navigated to a seat on the opposite side of Jim's desk. It's been my experience you don't do anything by accident. It's good to see you. To what do I owe this honor? Do you have a parking ticket that needs forgiveness? Oh, Jim, you know I rarely drive. I'm actually here for something far more serious. I'm here about Joanne Michaels. Detective Brinkman settled into his chair, a grave expression crossing his face. What about Joanne? I'd like her released from prison, into my custody. I think she's been locked up long enough. It's almost cruel to keep her in a cell. She's mentally ill, and I have a full staff that can attend to her needs at all hours of the day. It really is what's best. Rosie, she killed someone. Being locked up in a cell is far kinder than death. How does releasing her make any sense? It's common knowledge that Misty River's prisons are overcrowded. Releasing Joanne would be doing you a favor, and having her in my custody would ensure that she was properly taken care of. Imagine the positive press that would generate. This is a police department. We don't give a shit about press. We're here to protect and serve the people of Misty River. You really do have a lot of gumption coming here thinking you can get Joanne released from prison by batting your eyes at me. I must admit, I'm impressed, Bush. Oh, Jim. I'm not relying on my womanly charms to get what I want. I come to you as a friend. A very rich and powerful friend. Don't your officers need new squad cars? Uniforms? A modernized precinct? All I'm asking is to have one person released. Not a complete overhaul of the prison industrial complex. Sure, it's one person. But it's a person who murdered one of Misty River's most beloved residents. In cold blood, might I remind you. She was out of her mind! Sister Indica has that effect on people. If anyone should be locked behind bars, it's her. She really is a menace. Rosie, it's not going to happen. Sorry you wasted your time. If you have nothing else, I have a lot of paperwork to sort through. Rosie stood, almost defeated. But instead of leaving, she looked down at Jim. You know, Jim, I never wanted to play this card, but the fact that I am should tell you just how important Joanne is to me. Years ago, when we were still lovers, you told me you owed me. You and I both know why. However, today I'm asking for that favor you promised. I'm desperate, and desperate people can be dangerous. Jim knew exactly what Rosie was referring to, and he was thankful that she didn't say more than she did. His face flushed, and he nervously arranged and rearranged the papers on his desk. <sighs> Damn it, Rosie. Okay, fine. I'll do it. But this makes us even. Do we agree on that? I need to hear you say you agree. Yes, Jim. I agree. Thank you so much. You don't know what this means to me. Unbeknownst to them, Detective Grace Kowalski had been eavesdropping on their entire conversation. She waited for them to be out of sight before making a phone call. Hey, boss. Yeah, it's me. We have a development. Joanne Michaels is getting released from prison. It appears Rosie Bush has leverage on Jim Brinkman, and he caved. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty pathetic. Uh-huh. Yep. As soon as I find out more, you'll be the first to know. Have a safe flight. I'll see you soon. The Valducci private jet soared through a beautiful blue sky, miles above the Canadian Rockies. Vincenzo and his sister Fiona, along with her bodyguard, Dmitri Sokolov, sat in silence, sipping champagne and snacking on caviar. Their visit to their father, Fausta's villa, had been a tense one. The patriarch of the Valducci crime family was not pleased, and when Fausto wasn't happy... No one was happy. The problem is, Vincenzo couldn't recall a time when Fausto ever was happy. Come to think of it, he couldn't remember a time when he truly was either. 
Vincenzo's entire life had been centered around trying to please his father, but to no avail. Why was it so easy for Fiona? She and her father were as thick as thieves. Fausto clearly had a favorite. No matter how much money he made the family, or how many of Fausto's enemies he's vanquished, it was never good enough. Is it any wonder he left Alberta for the remote American mountain town of Misty River? At almost fifty years old, Vincenzo was getting sick of jumping through hoops to please the vengeful old man. He longed for a simpler life. Distance from the family fortune. What good is having all the money in the world if he was still trapped in his father's emotional prison? Are you ever going to stop pouting? Oh, shut up, Fiona. I'm not pouting. Oh, please. It's so obvious when you're in one of your little moods. Do you need some Midol? Do you have cramps? Fuck off. Just leave me alone. See? You are pouting. Look, I know you don't like coming home to see Daddy, but we're going back to Misty River now, so just change your tampon and smile. Jesus. You're right. I don't like coming back to Alberta. I'd be happy to never cross this fucking border ever again. How many more years am I going to have to be at his beck and call? As long as he's alive. You know, you're going to regret saying that one day when Daddy's gone. Pandora felt infinitely better after leaving St. Nora's orphanage, but Dante insisted that she rest until the morning. She hated being the center of attention, but she obliged him because she was still far too weak to argue. Dante tucked her into bed, got her some tea, and piled some pillows and blankets on the floor so he could keep watch over her. Aren't you being a little dramatic? Do you really think it's necessary to camp out on my floor all night? I can go if you want. The truth was, Pandora didn't want Dante to leave. His presence comforted her, and if anyone would understand what she was going through, it was him. He wasn't just the manager of her bookstore. He was a witch himself. However, he never used his abilities. When she asked him why, he vaguely alluded to something tragic happening in his past, but refused to elaborate, no matter how she badgered him. She eventually let it go, but a part of her was always curious. No, you can stay. After all, you did go through all the trouble of making yourself a little bed on the floor. Maybe it's best that I'm not alone tonight. Dante, what happened earlier has me fucked up. You of all people should have some idea of what the hell's going on. Am I going crazy, or do you think there's really something more to this? Based on what I saw, it seems like a classic case of psychometry where you get vibrations and visions by touching an object. Something as meaningful as Sister Indica's locket, which was given to her by someone who recently died, would be full of psychic energy. You've always had a gift, but until now it's been fairly mild. It's not uncommon for a witch's powers to unfold over time. I think you're just... blossoming. <laughs> you make me sound like a damn house plant. Even though you own a metaphysical bookstore, you've kept a distance from your own potential. It's almost like you're afraid. I think what happened is a sign that you need to move through that fear. Embrace who you are and step fully into your power. Isn't that a little hypocritical coming from you? No. I choose not to use my powers, but I don't deny them. That's a huge difference. The pair locked eyes and Pandora felt like he was reading her thoughts. She felt embarrassed because the truth was, he was more than just a friend and an employee to her. She was far too shy to act on her feelings, and he never gave her any romantic signal. She didn't want to read too much into his staying over, so she rolled a blunt as a cup of tea cooled. Suddenly there was a vigorous knocking on the front door. Pandora jumped. It was far too late for a visitor, and she wasn't expecting anyone. Seeing the fear in her eyes, Dante got to his feet. I'll get it. He walked down the flight of stairs and opened the door. Standing on the porch, illuminated by moonlight, was a small, older woman. Dante could see fire dancing in her eyes. He recognized her instantly. You must be Morgana Prince, Pandora's mother. No, I'm Betty Davis. I need to see my daughter. 
She's upstairs, in bed. Morgana climbed the flight of stairs to Pandora's loft. She looked at her daughter, who was now lighting the blunt she rolled, and shook her head. Ugh, haven't I taught you better than that? You rolled that thing way too tight. It'll never burn. Morgana crossed the room, snatched the blunt from Pandora's hand, and began tearing it apart and re-rolling it. <laughs> it's nice to see you too, Ma. So, are you going to tell me why you called me here? I didn't call you. I haven't used my phone all damn night. We don't need no stinking phones, Pandora. We're witches. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, you are a witch. You sent me a psychic message earlier today, and it took me hours to get here. So here I am. Do you care to tell your dear mother what the hell is going on? You mean you don't already know? <laughs> Not much of a witch, are you? Don't aggravate me, Pandora. I want to hear every detail, so spit it out. Dante could tell the two women were at stalemate, so he decided to fill Morgana in on everything that happened earlier that evening. By the end of the story, Morgana was beaming with pride. It's happening. Finally! Most witches don't have to wait until menopause to realize their full potential, but you always did march to the beat of your own drum. I'm so happy for you. Happy? I nearly died. Oh, don't be a drama queen. You aren't going to die. Being a witch is like being a surfer. You have to learn how to ride the wave. Otherwise, it'll knock you down. You have a lot to learn, daughter dear, and Mama's going to teach it to you. Dante, make up the guest room for me. I have a feeling I'm going to be here a while. Sister Indica sipped a vodka soda and stared out of her office's panoramic windows. Even though it was spring, Misty River's mountain tops remained white with snow. They would never thaw, and Sister Indica felt very much the same. Would this coldness and grief ever leave her? Not likely if she was forced to work with the person she hated most in this world, Rosie Bush. Rogue Nun Productions felt alien to her, and she hated being there. This place that was her heart and soul and her sanctuary, had turned foreign and unwelcoming. It would take a lot of vodka and copious amounts of weed to get her through this. Sister, just a reminder that we have our download meeting in 30 minutes. Hey, Bianca. If we can move it up, that would be great. I probably won't be here the whole day, and I have a lot to catch up on. Of course, I'll be right in. In no time, the leggy blonde was walking through the door with a folder filled with documents. Sister Indica could feel that something wasn't right with Bianca. What's going on? Something's up. I can feel it. Well, um, can I make myself a drink? Of course. All right. Let's hear it. Let's just say that Rogue Nun is not the same without you. Or with Rosie. Tell me about it. I smell her flowery old lady perfume in every inch of this place. I feel like I'm living in a grave blanket. And that's just one of the thousand things I've noticed in the hour that I've been here. Thankfully, I didn't see her when I showed up. She's with Ashley Costa, our new client. You mean Bruno's little sister? Oh my god, I haven't seen her in ages, since she was like nine or ten. Why is Rosie meeting with talent? Isn't that what I pay you for? That's the problem. Since you've been gone, she's changed everything. I've been pretty much sidelined and my role diminished, especially since she hired a new vice president of marketing who is now signing up clients all of a sudden. Who did she hire? Bianca sipped her drink and avoided Sister Indica's pleading eyes. Bianca. <sighs> Biff Barrington. Sister Indica's face reddened. She drained her glass and threw it angrily into the roaring fireplace. That's why I didn't tell you sooner. Sister Indica tore open a pack of cigarettes, lit one, and paced furiously around the office. Since when do you smoke cigarettes? Since now. Oh, that fucking whore. I want to rip her apart with my bare fucking hands, Bianca. Buying out my stockholders and trashing me to the media I can handle. 
I don't like it, but I can handle it. But hiring Biff Barrington after everything he did to me? This is low, even for that low-life Rosie Bush. Tell me about it. After she hired Biff, he signed Ashley Costa. I get that she's a great acquisition because of her enormous social media following, but he's in marketing. He's not in sales. He's basically taking what would be a huge bonus right out of my hands. I can't work like this, Indica. What are you saying? That today is my last day. I didn't want to leave while you were gone, so now that you're back, it's time for me to go. Oh, Bianca, you know how much you mean to me, to this company. I didn't build this alone. You helped me every step of the way. Is there anything I can do to change your mind? Anything at all? Yes. Do whatever is necessary to regain full control over Rogue Nun Productions. The women embraced, both beginning to weep. Bianca collected herself and left Sister Indica's office. Before she could close the door behind her, though, Biff Barrington grabbed it. You've got some fucking nerve, Biff. Can I please talk to you for a minute? Well, if you're planning on drugging me, good luck finding something strong enough. I toured with fish. Why are you wasting your time? What could you possibly say to me after how much you've betrayed me? I cared about you. You live with me, for God's sake. You were as close to me as anyone. You have every reason to hate me. But I honestly never set out to hurt you. I didn't even want your money or your company. I just wanted Seymour. He was the first guy to really show interest in me beyond just sex. (laughs) Do you know what it's like being this young and this hot? Look at me. Of course I do. He made me think he loved me and that drove me crazy. I did things I would never normally do. Look what I did to Pandora. She was like an aunt to me. I can't expect you to forgive me or to understand. I don't even forgive myself. Now that Seymour's out of the picture, it's like a spell was broken. I've awakened to the monster I had become, and I'd give anything to go back in time and change the past. Well, there ain't no time machines, bitch. We are the summation of our choices, like it or not. And choices have consequences. You're lucky I don't blow your fucking brains out all over this office. You're no killer. And I hate that what I've done has turned you into the cold, evil person standing before me. (laughs) You motherfuckers ain't seen shit. But you will. Now get out! A remorseful Biff left Sister Indica's office. She smoked in silence, her mind racing with all the things she'd like to say to Rosie and all the ways she'd liked her to pay for what she's done. She stamped the cigarette into an ashtray and marched out of the office, down the corridor to Rosie's wing of the building. Rosie's secretary tried to stop her, but she pushed past her and threw open the office doors. Out of my way, bitch! Rosie was chatting with Ashley and Bruno Costa over coffee. Someone's in a mood. Did they only have fat-free muffins in the cafeteria? I could kill you for hiring Biff, you rotted, red-haired cunt. Sister, your words. We have guests. Yeah, sister. For once, there's a lady in the room. Go fuck yourself, Bruno. As far as I'm concerned, you, Lorenzo, and Vivian are all dead to me. I'll never forgive you for handing my company over to this... this whore. It seems I made the right decision. Rogue Nun needed new, thoughtful leadership, and it's clear Rosie is that leader. Thank you, Bruno. You didn't just betray my business. You betrayed a friendship that has spanned decades. You were like family to me. How could you do this to me? Do I mean nothing to you? I liked you better when you were poor white trash. At least then you knew your place. I can't stand what you become. You've changed, not us. Take some ownership for once in your life. This, this, this is not the girl I became friends with all those years ago. By the looks of it, You ate her. You bastard. Ashley, I'm so sorry you had to witness my partner's unforgivable and highly unprofessional behavior. I'm sure you understand what she's gone through. You've seen the news. Oh my god, are you kidding me? I'm loving all this drama. Why isn't someone recording this? If you want a hit reality show, here you go. Just put a GoPro on this bitch. Oh, you little bitch. 
You want to slap too? I'm just getting warmed up. Ashley, that's a fantastic idea. No wonder you're such a successful content creator. We're so lucky to have you with us here at Rogue Nun Productions. I hope I'm not late for the meeting. Biff, you're right on time. Now, if you excuse us, sister, we have some business to attend to. Business that has brought in a lot of money and positive momentum since you've been gone. And as much as I'd love to indulge your tantrum, I have more important things to attend to at this time. Please leave. I'm going to make you pay for what you've done to me, Rosie. Mark my words, bitch. Joanne walked aimlessly around Rosie's mansion. Being out of prison was proving to be a hard adjustment. She didn't know what to do with herself now that she was free. She'd gotten so used to a confined space and having all her decisions made for her. Could she ever return to a normal life? She still couldn't believe Rosie was able to get her released. She fully expected to live her last days behind bars. What could Rosie have said to convince the warden to pardon her? Actually, she didn't want to know the answer to that question. The less she knew, the better. She had enough to be haunted by as it was. She walked through one of Rosie's gardens. The irises were in bloom and the sun warmed her face. She smiled slightly and tried to remember the last time she enjoyed spring this intensely. Just then she heard the sound of Tibetan bells ringing. Someone was at Rosie's front door. She worked her way through the labyrinth of a house and opened the ancient mahogany doors. Rather than a person, she found a gift-wrapped box. She picked it up to inspect it closer and saw a tag hanging from it. It was addressed to her. She went inside, afraid she was being watched. Who would possibly send her a gift? Who knew she was out of prison and staying with Rosie? This seemed off. Every nerve stood on end. She unwrapped the box, and when she saw what was inside, she recoiled in horror. Oh, my God! She dropped the box. Its contents emptied all over the floor. Several human teeth. A small note slipped out as well. Joanne nervously picked it up and read it out loud, her hands shaking the paper. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. I'm coming to collect. Leave and live, or stay and die. I, I have to get out of here. After packing a quick bag, Joanne ran to Rosie's garage, which was filled with cars, mostly collector's items. She needed something fast, so she took the blood-red Lamborghini Rosie bought herself on her 40th birthday. She threw her bag into the passenger seat and peeled out of the driveway, sending gravel and dust into the air. Joanne's mind raced. Where could she go that a killer couldn't find her? Only one place came to mind that was so remote, so off the grid, where she'd be safe. It wasn't the most ideal place to go, but her options were rather limited. When she finally pulled into the driveway on the farm, her heart sank. The old house, barn, and grain silo looked ominous in the moonlight. She parked the car and apprehensively approached the front door. She gathered her nerves and knocked. The seconds felt eternal. Finally, the door opened and a small, old, haggard woman in thick glasses appeared. She strained to see Joanne's face before crying out. Joanne! Oh my god, Ray, Joanne's back. She's back! <laughs> god is good, Lola. God is good, baby. I was just praying to the Lord about you, and look who showed up. Ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find. Lola, bring this wayward child up into our loving home. Lola gripped Joanne by the upper arm and dragged her inside, showing a surprising amount of strength for a woman of her years. The farmhouse was just how Joanne remembered it. Filthy. Filled with junk, garbage, and piles of dogs droppings as far as the eye could see. And the smell. It smelt as if one or more of their many dogs had died and their bodies lay undiscovered beneath the mounds of trash. 
Flies clung to the walls and ceiling, and Joanne held back vomit. You look tuckered out. Joanne, that, that must have been some drive. Should, should we show her the guest room, Ray? Absolutely, Lola, absolutely. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep is going to be sweet. Lola and Ray maneuvered her through a small path carved through the trash. They stopped at the old cellar door. We knew you'd come back some day. We've kept the guest room ready for you. Discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights you'd undesire. Just then, Ray grabbed a rusted pipe and brought it down hard onto Joanne's head. She collapsed, blood pouring from the fresh wound. Grab her feet, Lola. The couple carried Joanne down a flight of rickety stairs and tossed her into a handmade cell. Ray slammed the door and locked it. Joanne lay on the dirt floor in a bloody pile. Lola, call Grace and tell her I want my money now. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands, they bring wealth. <laughs> Sister Indica's limo drove through the gates of the Valducci mansion just as she was finishing a joint. She had been there many times over the years, but something about tonight made it seem different. She wore a brand new gown for the occasion, lilac silk with plunging neckline to showcase her stunning breasts. She'd picked it up that afternoon at Goldie's after her awful day at the office. She gathered her mink coat, exited the car, and let her driver know when to return. Soon the doors opened, and standing there was Vincenzo Valducci, wearing a black suit and purple dress shirt, which was unbuttoned a bit, revealing graying chest hair. Sister Indica, you look ravishing. Come inside, I'll take your coat. You clean up pretty well yourself, Vinny. I like how we're matching. Purple and plenty of cleavage. <laughs> I'll admit, Giovanni picked this out. He's always had an eye for fashion. And where is Giovanni? Uh, I, um, he, well, ac actually, uh, ah, never mind. I can't lie to you, Indica. It's just us this evening. You know, Vinny, if you wanted this to be a date, you could have just called me and asked me out yourself. Sending your son to do your dirty work? <laughs> well, that is actually pretty on brand for you, isn't it? Well, I mean, I do have a reputation to uphold, don't I? Follow me, I've got drinks prepared. Sister Indica followed Vincenzo into his library. She accepted a vodka martini and clinked her glass against his. Cheers, Vinny. To a beautiful evening with a beautiful woman. They each sipped their drinks. Sister Indica looked around the library and noticed many vases of fresh lilacs. Did you color coordinate the flowers with your outfit or is that just a coincidence? Giovanni told me they were your favorite flower. You sure do know how to make a lady feel welcome. Did Gio tell you how much I love diamonds, too? <laughs> well, I have a strict rule. It's no diamonds on the first date. Maybe our second date, if there is a second date, of course. The pair locked eyes as they sipped their cocktails. Sister Indica felt Vincenzo's gaze undressing her. Suddenly a bell rang throughout the mansion. That chef letting us know dinner's ready. The pair were seated in a formal dining room. The butler placed their first courses in front of them on golden plates. Sister Indica noticed more vases of lilacs, in every room, in fact. Bon appetito! Thank you for everything, Vinny. I, I really needed a night out. It's been a while. <sighs> I'm so sorry for everything you've gone through. The press certainly hasn't been kind. No, they haven't, but I've done a lot of soul-searching and have learned quite a few lessons these last few months. That counts for something, right? God, you have such an incredible attitude. You know, most people would be destroyed by what you've gone through. But here you are, stronger than ever. That must really piss off your enemies. In many ways, I feel like the underdog. But I have a feeling the tides will turn. One way or another, I'll make them turn. <laughs> You're a formidable woman, Indica. You're no slouch yourself, Finny. You had an empire of your own and have a long list of enemies as well. 
what would they think if they truly knew how sweet you actually were? <sighs> you know, I often feel like the wizard, you know, the one from Oz. Everyone sees the terrifying projection, but if you ever really f- see the person behind the curtain, don't we all do that? Create and maintain these facades while keeping who we really are carefully hidden? I've built an empire being myself and sharing my deepest flaws and traumas. Part of me wishes I'd kept more of it to myself. I've always admired your rawness and honesty. I often felt like I was living a lie. Well, this year is still fairly new. How about we set intentions to have you open up more, and for me to maintain a bit more mystery? You may be honest, but you're still very mysterious. The butler cleared away their dishes and brought over the mink course. When he lifted the lid, it revealed a plate of duck. Sister Indica grimaced. Oh, no, you don't like duck. Damn it! Why didn't I clear that with Giovanni first? Don't sweat it. I wasn't planning to eat much anyway. Not in this dress. I do have an idea, though, if you're up for an adventure. I'm always up for an adventure. Good. Take me to your kitchen. The pair left the dining room and practically skipped across the expansive mansion to the main kitchen. Vincenzo dismissed the staff so that he and Sister Indica had the place all to themselves. She demanded to know where the pantry was located and disappeared for a few minutes before returning with a loaf of bread, some peanut butter, and a jar of dill pickles. Oh, Lord, what are you doing, woman? It's an adventure, Vinny. Do you trust me? (laughs) I do. Okay, okay, take me on this adventure. Moments later, Sister Indica had prepared a peanut butter and pickle sandwich and cut it into two. She gave Vincenzo one side, and she took the other. Are you ready for the surprise of your life? (laughs) This better be good. With some apprehension, Vincenzo took a bite of the sandwich. She was right. It was delicious. See? You're into it. I knew it. My mom used to make this for me as a kid. It's my favorite. You know, I thought this was the kind of thing a pregnant woman would make, but... It's actually delicious. Man, you sure are full of surprises, aren't you? Uh Uh-oh, you've got some peanut butter on you. Sister Indica touched Vincenzo's face and wiped away a bit of peanut butter from his mouth. Her heart began to race and she could feel her face turning red. Vincenzo took her hand in his, kissing it gently. He then took her in his arms and kissed her passionately. Before she knew it, she was being carried up the stairs into Vincenzo's master suite. He tore off her dress and she gave herself over to him fully. While Vincenzo and Sister Indica made love, Dmitri Sokolov was arriving at the Moya farm. Thankfully, Detective Grace Kowalski had microchipped Duran, which made finding her a breeze. He banged forcefully on the door. Lola opened it apprehensively. Bring me, Joanne. Do you have our money? You'll have your money when I have Joanne. Now bring her to me. She's indisposed at the moment. You'll have to come inside and get her yourself. If she is dead, she is no use to me. She's not dead. She's just a little bloody. Irritated, Dimitri entered the farmhouse. Ray led him into the basement, to the cage where Joanne was laying, breathing, but still unconscious. If she dies, you'll have Fiona Valducci to deal with. And trust me, you don't want to deal with her. Still, she sends her thanks for your hospitality. He handed Ray a thick envelope full of cash. Ray unlocked the cage, and Dimitri carried Joanne out of the basement and out to his car. She lay in the back seat, quietly whimpering in pain. Don't worry, Joanne. When I'm done with you, you'll be as good as new.
It had been some time since Joanne had been abducted by Dmitri Sokolov. When she first woke, she was in a windowless cement room. There was a metal door, a cot, a bucket, and a bare bulb on a rope swinging gently in the breeze from the air vent. She could hear water dripping in the distance and occasionally the hollow sound of footsteps. She surmised that she was underground, but where? Her first thought was that she was back in prison and her release was just a dream, but it became clear that while she was certainly being detained, this was no prison. It felt far more sinister. Days passed. She wasn't fed, but she was given a steady supply of water. The lapses in time made her realize that she was being drugged. After a while, she stopped drinking water in hopes that she'd stay awake long enough to figure out who was holding her and what they wanted from her. She regretted this decision. That's when the torture began. Dimitri became the only figure she knew, and she never knew what she was going to get when he burst through the door. Would it be a lashing? Hard slaps across the face? Waterboarding? Worse yet were the times he'd come in with a beautifully cooked meal and feed it to her gently. He'd wipe her face and tenderly stroke her hair, which had grown matted from lack of brushing and washing. When she'd get lulled into a false sense of security, the violent beatings would return. Eventually, she began to lose a sense of who she was. That's when the brainwashing began. Dmitri used every technique he'd learned during his time as a high-ranking official in the Russian army to destroy Joanne and rebuild her into a ruthless operative fully under his control. He was shocked at how quickly he was able to recreate her. She must have been damaged when he found her. The time came for him to unveil his creation to Fiona Valducci. She burst through the door of Joanne's cell. I've given you weeks, Dima. Don't disappoint me. Dimitri left the cell and brought in Joanne, who had been getting ready in another room. She was dressed in a black Chanel suit and five-inch alligator heels. Her hair was a large mass of beautiful curls, and she had a wild look in her eyes. Alligator, this is how you're spending the budget I gave you? She has a very important job, and she needs to look as valuable as she is. I'm pleased to introduce you to Natalia. It is pleasure to be meeting you. Mrs. Valducci. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you too, uh, Natalia. I trust Dimitri has given you your orders. Da. I am to go to Rognan Productions and retrieve one rosy bush. I am encouraged to use force, but no lethal. She is to be brought back here, to the Valducci mansion, alive but unconscious. And you're sure you're up for this task? I was programmed to succeed. <laughs> I must I must say, Dima, darling, I'm impressed. Very impressed. You've outdone yourself yet again. Well, I've got to go. I have an appointment for a Brazilian wax. Meanwhile, at Rogue Nun Productions, Rosie was in her office finishing up. She had another successful day of meetings, and she just got a report showing profits skyrocketing. She always knew she had what it took to run her own company, and while buying up the stocks of her nemesis was an odd way to get her into the business, she was proud of herself. She shut down her computer and was mixing herself a gin and tonic when Biff tapped on her office door. Oh, hello, Biff. Come inside. Would you care for a drink? That sounds lovely. Thank you. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Biff, I always have time for you. I'm glad you stopped by, actually. I've been meaning to talk with you. Is everything okay? Everything couldn't be better. You've really outdone yourself in the short time you've been a part of Rogue Nun Productions. As you know, after Bianca Wolf left, the role of Vice President of Acquisitions has been vacant. You've done such an amazing job, bringing on Ashley Costa as well as several other high-profile clients. 
I'd like for you to have that job, if you're interested. Really? A promotion? Of course I accept. Thank you so much for believing in me. I won't let you down, I swear. The job does have some downsides. It's a lot of extra work. And you'll have to work closely with Sister Indica. I hope that doesn't make you reconsider. But I'd understand if it did. I mean, I have my office clear on the other side of the building to be as far away from her as possible. I'm professional enough that I can withstand the avalanche of attitude. I'm sure she'll be heaping on me. Where is she, by the way? I didn't see her in her office all day. She's sick. If it's not one thing with her, it's another. I'm just glad she's not around. Cheers. To a profitable year. Oh, I've been meaning to ask you. Have you heard anything from Joanne? (sighs) No, I haven't. The Misty River police have found no trace of her or my missing Lamborghini. I even hired a private detective and nothing. She just vanished. I'm so worried about her. But thankfully Rogue Nun has kept me so busy I haven't really had the time to dwell on it. I guess I should thank Sister Indica for letting this company fall into such disarray. Her mess has been a wonderful distraction. I'm so sorry to hear that. I really do hope she's okay. She's a lot stronger than she looks. I have faith I'll see her again. Well, enough of that. We're celebrating. Excuse me, Biff. This is Rosie. Oh, hello, Jim. It's so good to hear your voice. Dinner? Tonight? Oh, that sounds lovely. I'm just finishing up at work and was so busy I didn't even have lunch. Yes, I'll head right over to the police station. See you soon. Goodbye, Jim. Well, looks like I have a date. Could this day get any better? Biff finished his drink and said his goodbyes. Rosie gathered her purse, coat and briefcase and walked out to her car. She noticed a blood-red Lamborghini in the parking lot. It was her car. Oh, my God. Joanne? Could it be? The driver's side door swung open, and there was Joanne, alive and well, and looking better than ever. She was dressed chicly, and had a confidence and poise Rosie had never seen before. It was like Joanne was a whole other person. Joanne! Oh, Joanne, I've missed you so much. I've been so worried about you. I thought something awful happened. Hello, Rosie. Joanne, what's with the accent? Get in the car. I'm on my way to the police station. I have dinner plans with Jim. How about I meet you back at my place? Get into car now! Rosie felt a chill run down her spine. Something was seriously wrong with Joanne. Did her mind finally snap? Had she finally gone mad beyond the point of return? Joanne, you're scaring me. I think it's better if I just go. As Rosie turned to leave, Joanne produced a thin rope and started to choke her from behind. Joanne! What are you doing? You're hurting me! Joanne! The struggle didn't last long. Dimitri had trained her to be efficient. Rosie collapsed at Joanne's feet, unconscious but still alive, just as Joanne was instructed. She dragged Rosie's body into the Lamborghini before speeding off, back to the Valducci mansion. Sister Indica was curled up on a chair long, a fur blanket pulled up to her chin. She felt absolutely awful. She couldn't remember a time when she had the flu this bad. She could barely keep anything down, no matter how much weed she smoked to get an appetite. Thankfully, Pandora and her mother Morgana were on their way over with some homemade soup. Even though she'd been staying with Pandora for weeks, Sister Indica hadn't seen Morgana in years. She rarely visited Misty River, so it would be nice to catch up with her. She was a firecracker, and Sister Indica found her highly entertaining. She dozed off slightly, but awoke when she heard the doorbell chime. 
I'm in here. Moments later, Pandora and Morgana appeared with a huge pot of soup in tow. I'll put this in the kitchen and bring you a bowl. Would you like some crackers? Yes, please. It's nice to see you, sis. I wish you were feeling better, though. Don't get too close. I don't want you to catch this flu. Thank you so much for bringing me something to eat. You guys are so good to me. I always did love your cooking. You look pretty good for someone so sick. Let me see if you have a fever. Morgana placed her palm against Sister Indica's forehead. Nope. No fever. Are you sure you have the flu? I don't know. I just know I've been puking my guts out and feel like absolute shit. If I don't feel better soon, I'll check in with Dr. Banks. I really can't take much more time off work. Rosie Bush might turn my office into an ashram. All right, girl, I want you to eat this, and I won't take no for an answer. You never take care of yourself. It's no wonder you're sick. Thank you, mother. I'm surprised Vincenzo Valducci isn't over here nursing you back to health. You two have been spending quite a bit of time together. Yes, we have, but I'm trying to keep this casual. Girl, you ain't never had a casual romance with any man. You were all in or not in at all. But this one seems different. He's got a bad reputation, but I can tell he's a good guy deep down. And I don't think this one's gay. <laughs> no, he's definitely not gay. He's blowing your back out, ain't he, bitch? <laughs> hey, he dicking you the fuck down. I know it. Pandora, I don't want to talk about that in front of your mother. Just because I'm older doesn't mean I'm not a sexual being. I was a groupie for God's sake. I could tell you stories that would blow that turban right off your head. A groupie? Yes. In fact, Pandora's father was a jazz musician. A drummer. Oh, the things he could do with those hands. Too bad it was a fleeting romance. But I have Pandora, and I couldn't be happier. My precious little witch. Ma! What? I'm proud of you. And I know you're a skeptic, sister, but you need to get over that. We didn't just come here with soup. We came here with information you need to hear. Is it lottery numbers? I could never have too much money, you know. No. It's a long story. The women told Sister Indica about Pandora's powers unfolding and that Morgana had stayed to teach her everything she needed to know to use and control her new abilities. They explained that Pandora's little episode at St. Nora's Orphanage was actually Lily Banks trying to contact Sister Indica. Let's say I suspend disbelief and accept what you're saying as a fact. What message does Lily have for me? Give me your locket and I'll make contact with her. Sister Indica removed the locket, the first time since Lily had given it to her, and handed it over to Pandora. All right, Sylvia Brown. Let's hear what Lily has to say. Pandora took the locket in her hand, closed her eyes, and mentally asked Lily to come forward. She felt that rush of psychic power, but this time she was able to ride the wave and let the energy flow through her. Okay, she's here. She's showing me images. Someone's going to stop by with a box of her belongings, including letters she'd written to you before her death. Okay, also, she's asking me to take a pen and paper. There's something you need to know. Morgana, there's some paper and a pen in that drawer over there. Morgana retrieved the pad of paper and pen and handed it to Pandora, whose eyes were still closed. Pandora took the pad and pen and began drawing random lines. Fascinating. Ugh. Just watch. Eventually, the scribbles subsided and Pandora started writing actual words. The first word... Twin. Twin? <laughs> Is she trying to say I have a twin? Pandora wrote the word, yes. Yes, I have a twin. <laughs> Do I know this person? Pandora once again wrote the word, yes. Well, who is it? Who's my twin? Pandora paused and then began slowly writing each letter. When she stopped writing, she opened her eyes and looked at the paper. No fucking way. Oh, please tell me she's joking. Do ghosts have a sense of humor? Dear God, please don't let this be true. Pandora balled up the piece of paper as the doorbell rang. Morgana jumped to her feet to see who it was. It was Greta Schumacher from St. Nora's Orphanage. 
Hi, sister. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I have something for you. Come on in, Greta. You're not disturbing me. Since we're renovating, we needed to clear out Lily's room. To be honest, I was avoiding it. I wanted to leave everything as it was. But her old room is now going to be part of our new educational wing, so I didn't have much choice. This box was addressed to you. I didn't open it, but I figured you would want it. I know how close you two were. Thank you so much, Greta. I appreciate you stopping by. That's very sweet of you. Greta said her goodbyes, and as soon as she was gone, Pandora turned to Sister Indica. See, bitch, just like Lily said. I bet you there's letters in that box. Intrigued, Sister Indica tore open the box, and sure enough... It was filled with letters, jewellery, photos, and other sentimental items. Okay, fine, I believe, okay? I believe. But this is all a little bit too much for me right now. Finding out I have a long-lost twin sister I can't stand has been enough excitement for one day. I don't think I have the strength to start reading these letters. We'll read them when you're ready. The women sat in silence for a moment. Morgana looked over to the crumpled paper. All she could make out was the letter V. When Rosie regained consciousness, she was tied to a chair in a cold, dark room. There was a bag over her head, making it hard to breathe. Suddenly it was torn off and she gasped in fresh air. (gasps) Joanne switched on a light in the cell Rosie's eyes adjusted and she took in her surroundings An empty cement room Joanne, please let me go I don't know why you're doing this You're my best friend The name is Natalia Beach And you aren't going anywhere Until the boss says so Natalia? You must have gone so crazy that you developed a split personality. Joanne, I know you're in there, and I know you don't want to do this. You aren't a violent person, except for killing Lily Banks. That was a fluke. Joanne pulled out a taser and jabbed it into Rosie's side. Oh! Moments later, the metal door creaked open and in walked Fiona Falducci, a huge smile on her face. Well done, Natalia. Rosie Bush, I hope you're enjoying your new accommodations. We want this to be a restful stay. Fiona Valducci, I should have known you were behind this. What have you done to Joanne? Oh, I'll just spare you all of the details, but let's just say that Natalia is the new and improved Joanne. Joanne 2.0. I like this version much better, don't you? Joanne once again stuck the taser into Rosie's side. Oh, Fiona, you bitch! (laughs) Do you really think it's wise to insult the person who holds your life in their hands? I always thought you were smarter than that. Well, if you were really smart, you never would have done what you did to my nephew, Giovanni. He was going to kill me. I didn't have a choice. It was him or me. And I didn't even kill him. He lived. If this is about the money Vincenzo loaned me, I'll pay it back. I'll triple it. I don't give a fuck about Vincenzo's money. You don't fuck with my family and walk away unscathed. It's just not my style, Rosie. But you're going to learn, and it'll be a lesson you'll never forget. Give her another taste, Natalia. While Fiona was getting warmed up, Detective Jim Brigman was at the Misty River Police Department waiting for Rosie. It wasn't like her not to show up. His senses told him something was very wrong. Detective Grace Kowalski stopped by his office on her way out. Hey, Jim. I thought you were supposed to leave hours ago. Want me to bring you back some dinner? Thanks, Grace. But I was waiting for Rosie Bush. She was supposed to be here at six. I've called and left messages. This is not like her. I have a feeling the Valducci's got to her. The Valducci's? Why do you say that? Long story, but she made the wrong people her enemies. You know how violent they can be. I sure do. You don't want to cross them, that's for sure. I can swing by the Valducci mansion if you'd like, to check things out. 
Thank you, but I need to take care of this one myself. Well, I hope it's just a big misunderstanding. Call my cell if you need backup. I sure will. Thanks again, Grace. Grace watched Jim grab his gun and leave his office. She waited for him to be out of earshot before she called Fiona. Hey, boss. It's me. He's on his way over and he's looking for Rosie. He just left, but it won't be long until he's there. My pleasure, boss. Let me know if there's anything else I can do to help. Jim sped through Misty River, his sirens blaring. He would do whatever it took to make sure Rosie was safe and the Valducci's were finally behind bars. They were always so clever and careful. He could never find anything that would stick to them, but this... Oh, they'd pay for hurting Rosie. He just prayed he would find her in time. The Valducci mansion was expansive and filled with countless secret rooms and tunnels. When he finally approached the gates of the mansion, he punched the gas and plowed right through them. His car screeched to a stop and he bounded to the front door, his gun drawn. He tried the handle. Surprisingly, it was unlocked. He opened the door carefully and crept inside. The first door he happened by was the library. He noticed that the fireplace, while roaring with a fire, looked odd. Almost like it was open? He got closer to it, and sure enough, it was a secret passageway. But what kind of fool would leave a secret passageway open? Just then, Dimitri appeared behind him and smashed him in the back of the head with a hammer. Jim collapsed, and Dimitri grabbed his legs and dragged the unconscious detective through the hidden corridor, closing the fireplace behind him. Sister Indica's illness was unrelenting. She was left with no other choice than to pay a visit to Dr. Victor Banks. She hoped whatever was plaguing her could be treated easily and quickly because her absence from rogue nun had given Rosie Bush the upper hand. She had to quell that at all costs and regain her place on the throne as rogue nun's rightful queen. Dr. Banks was at the nurse's station making notes in a chart and Sister Indica arrived wearing a dark blue velour jumpsuit and white fur coat. Hello, Sister. I must say you're the most overdressed patient I've had all day. You don't look sick to me. Victor, I know I look beautiful, but I am indeed very sick. I want you to run a battery of tests, leave no stone unturned. It is imperative that I get well completely and quickly. My empire depends on it. How dramatic. Let's go into an exam room. I promise we'll get to the bottom of this and save your empire. Sister Indica sat in the exam room, wearing only the hospital gown Victor had given her. He'd taken various blood samples and ran several tests, all of which the lab was expediting since she was such a high-profile client. After waiting what felt like a lifetime, Dr. Victor Banks returned with a slight smirk on his face. What's so fucking funny, Victor? It better not be cancer. No, no, it's definitely not cancer. But I have got to the bottom of what is going on. You're not sick. Well, then why do I feel so awful? I can't keep anything down. I'm exhausted. I have terrible, pounding headaches. How can I feel so bad and not be sick? Congratulations, sister. You're pregnant. You're kidding. I'm afraid not, sister. How far along am I? We'll need to give you an ultrasound to know for sure. You'll want to make an appointment with Dr. Rocky Hernandez for that. Now would be a good time to cut out the booze and whatever else it is you regularly ingest. Sister Indica was in too much shock to give Dr. Banks a stabbing retort. She was going to be a mother? She'd never wanted or expected to raise a child. How could she focus on rebuilding her career and building a life with Vincenzo? If there was a child involved, it would take every bit of focus and attention. Could she be that selfless? Could she put someone else's needs and wants above her own? What about Vincenzo? Should she tell him he's going to be a father? Or should she terminate the pregnancy and pretend it never happened? Certainly that would simplify things. Her head was spinning. Thank you, Victor. 
You're welcome, sister. Oh, and thank you for everything you're doing at St. Nora's Orphanage. My mother and I may not have gotten along very well, but I know how much St. Nora's meant to her. The way you're helping those children shows what great maternal instinct you have. Thank you for saying that. It means more to me than you know. Sister Indica gathered her fur coat and purse and left the hospital. Her driver was waiting out front for her. Take me to Vincenzo's, darling, and take the scenic route. I have some decisions to make. Meanwhile, in the bowels of the Valducci mansion, Jim was waking in his cell. The room was pitch black until someone pulled a chain on the hanging bulb. It was Rosie. Rosie, I knew the Valducci's got to you. Oh my God, you're hurt. What did those monsters do to you? Jim, you have to be quiet. If they think we're still unconscious, they'll leave us alone. Gotcha. Oh, you look wrecked. I am so sorry they did this to you. I should never have made you release Joanne from prison. The Valducci's turned her into some Russian mercenary. She's unhinged. The Valducci's made Joanne... Russian? I don't get it either. She goes by the name Natalia now. The whole thing is very creepy. But she's evil. She did this to me at Fiona and Dimitri's direction. I'm so sorry for blackmailing you and forcing you to release her. This is all my fault. You didn't blackmail me. You called in a favor. If your father hadn't helped me out all those years ago by... making that little problem go away, I'd never be a detective. Shit, I may be in prison. The only reason he did what he did was because you begged him to. I owe you my life. Thank you, Jim. I begged my father for his help because I loved you. And clearly a part of me always has. This was supposed to be a romantic evening. Not exactly what I had in mind. I'd rather be beaten and held prisoner with you than with any other woman on earth. I won't let them hurt you again, Rosie. I will die first. As Rosie wept in Detective Brinkman's arms, Sister Indica's limousine was pulling up to the mansion. Vincenzo met her at the door, his arms stretched out wide. The couple embraced, then went inside to the library, which had become Sister Indica's favorite room in the house. Would you care for a drink? Just club soda for me, thanks. Club soda? You must really be sick. What did the doctor say? Oh, it's nothing. I'll be okay. Well, that's good news. Let's drink to that. I'm really glad you're here. There's been something I've been meaning to discuss with you. Ooh, sounds dramatic. No, 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 no. I mean, nothing like that. It's it's just that I've, I am, um, well, I, I've been wanting to tell you that, that I've really enjoyed the time we've been spending together all these weeks. I feel the same way, Vinny. I'm not expressing myself clearly. Um, oh God. Why am I so nervous? Uh, what I want to say is I care about you. A lot. Vinny, I care about you too. A lot. No, 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 no. Damn it, Vincenzo, spit it out. Okay. I, um, I'm in love with you, Indica. I love you. Oh, Vinny. Vincenzo took Sister Indica in his arms and kissed her deeply and passionately. I'm not trying to pressure you or anything like that. I know it hasn't been that long since your relationship with Seymour ended. Plus losing Mrs. Banks and everything with Rogue Nun. I know you've got a lot on your plate and your mind. So don't feel like you have to say it back. It, it's just something that I needed you to know. Vinny, I do have a lot on my mind and my life couldn't be more of a wreck. But you have been the best thing to happen to me in a long, long time. You're so easy to be around. You take away all my stress and worries. When I'm with you, nothing else matters. I love you, too, very much. You hear that, Vincenzo Valducci? I love you, too. I've never been this happy, ever. My life went from gray to technicolor the day you walked into my house wearing that stunning lilac dress. Which you owe me for, by the way. You ripped that thing to shreds when you ravaged me like a wild animal. I'll buy you the entire store. You're too good to me. You are the light of my life, and I always want you in it. Do you ever think about the future? You know, at my age, it's all I think about. And I see you right there by my side every step of the way. Traveling the world together, having amazing adventures, 
Just the two of us. Well, one day a little Vincenzo? Vinny, it's all I've been thinking about these days. I feel like I'm at a crossroads. The, the first part of my life was all about achieving all my outlandish goals, and the second part is all about enjoying what I've earned. I did it. I made it. I think it's time to appreciate it now, and I couldn't think of a better person to appreciate it with. I see you're in face by my little Vincenzo remark. <laughs> you didn't strike me as the type that'd want to have children. Do they make couture maternity clothes? <laughs> <laughs> you can get anything at Goldie's. Vinny, I never thought I'd want kids either, but that's because I, I always imagined myself raising them alone. I guess I never expected to find a man who would truly be my equal partner in life. I also feared I'd make the same mistakes my mother did, and I don't want my child to grow up resenting me like I do her. But you make me think the unthinkable, because I truly do feel like I can rely on you, and that you're with me 50-50. You make me want to conquer all my fears, and including motherhood. Uh, and the more that we talk about it, the more I want it. But no pressure, really. I'm not asking you to marry me or anything, but when you're ready, when you feel it's right, I would like you to move in. Move in? Here? I don't know, Vinny, that depends. Oh? <laughs> On what? And if you have room for a nursery. Vinny, I'm not sick. I'm pregnant. Vincenzo's eyes widened, filling with tears. A smile as wide as the Misty River horizon spread across his face. Are you kidding me? We're gonna... We're gonna have a baby? We're... We're gonna have a baby? We're gonna have a baby! The couple embraced, filled with joy. Just then, Dmitri Sokolov approached Vincenzo. Dmitri, can you believe it? Indica's pregnant. We're gonna have a baby! Congratulations to you both. Mr. Valducci, if I may speak to you for a moment, in private, about that matter that we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah of, of course. Let's, let, let's talk in my office. Indica, make yourself at home. This is your home now. Sister Indica was left alone. She sipped her club soda and looked around and couldn't believe all this would be hers. As she was taking in her surroundings, seeing it all anew as a resident and not as a guest, she noticed something peculiar about the fireplace. It was shifted somehow. She inspected it closer. Placing her hand on the mantel, she gently pushed. The fireplace swung open, revealing a passageway. Her heart raced. She'd always loved the idea of hidden rooms and secret passageways. It was like being in a movie. Her curiosity raged. She grabbed her purse and went inside. She flipped on a light switch and closed the fireplace behind her. There was no going back now. She walked carefully through the long corridor, which wound round and round, leading downwards. At last she stopped inside a long, dimly lit cement hallway. Every so many feet was a door on either side. She counted eight rooms as well as a large door directly ahead. One of the rooms had a light on. She tiptoed over to it and peered carefully through the thin window cut into the metal. It was Rosie Bush and Detective Jim Brinkman. Sister Indica quietly gasped. Suddenly she heard footsteps, heels on cement. It was a woman. She looked around and saw that the cell across some roses was empty and unlocked. She ran into it and closed the metal door slowly and quietly behind her. While Pandora was preoccupied with Morgana's witchcraft lessons, Dante Fox had Destranger's bookstore all to himself. There were a few customers this week, so he had a lot of time to kill. Any spare moment he had, he dedicated to researching complex spell work. The world was unpredictable, and one never knew what knowledge would come in handy. He was especially drawn to necromancy. He was leafing through an ancient book on black magic when Morgana appeared. Oh, hi, Morgana. I didn't see you come in. Hi, Dante. Pandora's taking a nap. 
I think I was pushing her too hard. Younger witches have more stamina, I guess. So what are you up to? The store's pretty quiet today. Oh, I'm just organizing books and doing some reading. Gotta know what you're selling. So you're telling me that book you're reading is one for sale here? I don't think I like your tone. I'll be direct. My daughter is a white witch. I am a white witch. Just like my family's entire lineage. What is a book of black magic doing in this bookstore? I think it's foolish to limit your education. How do you know what you're up against and how to defeat it if you refuse to learn about it? Oh, so it's simply curiosity and education with you, is it? As you know from all your studies, practicing black magic invites all manner of evil. Protecting my daughter is my utmost concern. I thought it was yours as well. Of course it is. I'd never put Pandora in harm's way. I look. I care about her too much. The more I learn, the more I can protect her. There's something else driving this. Are you going to level with me, or am I going to have to drag it out of you? Emika. It's because of Emika. She was my wife. So you're researching this to bring her back to life? No, it's my fault she died. It was before I had control over my abilities. We got into a fight, things were said, powers were used, and she died. I tried to bring her back, but I failed, and I've carried the guilt with me ever since. I can't let the same thing happen to Pandora. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if it did. Oh, Dante. Black magic cannot be the solution to your problems. It only invites more. Using it creates a spiritual debt that you will never be able to repay. I can tell my daughter has feelings for you, too. She wouldn't want you to be tethered to the dark side. Think of Pandora. Think of yourself. As much as he'd like it not to be true, Dante knew Morgana was right. He put the book of black magic into a metal trash can and began to speak. The book burst into flames. It wasn't long before there was nothing left but ash. I'm impressed. You've got talent, kid. As the smoke from Dante's fire still lingered, Pandora appeared behind the register. Dante, you made Pandora appear. You really are good. (laughs) You're so stupid. There's a door back here. I just got up from my nap. Are you going to let me get any real work done today, lady? Pandora, I could slap you silly. This is real work. Look at how far you've come in this short time. You've really embraced the process. Don't back out on me now. Yeah, you're right. I guess a part of me misses the life before all this started happening. This power comes with a responsibility, and I don't know that I'm that responsible of a person. It's like motherhood. You just figure it all out. Right, Dante? Oh, yes. That's exactly how I'd describe it. Whilst the trio chattered, Sister Indica was still in the secret chamber under the Valducci mansion, waiting for the mystery woman who was walking the corridor to leave. The footsteps stopped outside her door. As she braced for confrontation, she realized they were going into Rosie's cell instead. She held her breath and listened intently, trying to make out the voice. It was Fiona. Suddenly, Sister Indica had an idea. It was risky, but her life had been one huge gamble after another. It was worth a shot. She left her hiding place and marched confidently into Rosie and Jim's cell. Sister, oh, thank God we're saved. Don't get too excited, Rosie. What the hell are you doing down here, Indigo? Hey, it's not my fault whoever works for you is too dumb to close a secret passageway behind them. Like you wouldn't go snooping around, too. I'm only human. You do realize that Vincenzo knows I have Rosie and Jim down here, right? This isn't a secret. I knew exactly what I was getting into when I started dating Vinny. I'm not here to change him. But I do have a huge favor to ask you. Would you release Rosie and Jim? By the looks of it, you made your point. Listen, lady. Just because you are shacking up with my brother doesn't mean that you get to tell me how to run our business. 
I'll make a deal with you. If you do this for me, I am indebted to you. You can call on me for any favor, no questions asked. Thank you, sister. Thank you so much. Shut up. Fiona hasn't agreed yet. Fiona gave Sister Indica's offer some thought. She did think Rosie and Jim got her message and wouldn't have held them much longer. But having Sister Indica indebted to her was an intriguing proposition. She knew a good deal when she heard it, especially one that would benefit her. I accept your offer. I'll call Dimitri to release them. Not so fast. There is a condition. For Rosie. Please, sister. Anything. I'll do anything to get out of here. You're going to resign from your position at Rogue Nun Productions and sign all of your shares over to me, which would make me the sole owner and president. Fine. I agree. Have your lawyer send over the paperwork. Sister Indigo reached into her purse and pulled out a set of documents. I didn't spend every minute away from Rogue Nun crying over Lily's death. I also spent some time with my lawyer, drafting this agreement up months ago. I didn't think the day would come when I'd find you in such a vulnerable position, but uh, I guess I have to thank Fiona for that. Rosie took the papers and pen from Sister Indica. Make it legible. I don't want people to think this was forged. I have a stipulation as well, before I sign this. Do you really think you're in a position to negotiate? Please, hear me out. I will sign this resignation letter and give you all my shares in Rogue Nun Productions, if you'll... Have them reverse Joanne's brainwashing. She's my only friend in this world. I'm begging you. Do this for me and I'll give you everything you've asked for. I didn't realize Joanne was brainwashed. Uh, Fiona, is that something you can undo? Well, I don't think it's going to be easy, but it is possible. I guess since you're practically family now, I can do this for you. Rosie, you heard Fiona. Sign. Rosie signed the documents. Sister Indica grabbed them and stuffed them back into her purse. Well, Vinny's probably wondering where I am. Is there a shortcut out of here or something? I'll show you. Rosie, Jim, I'll send Dimitri in to have you both released. I think it goes without saying that running to the authorities is not in either of your best interests. Our network is wide and in all layers of government, including the Misty River Police Department. Do send my thanks to Grace Kowalski. Without her help, none of this would have been possible. Moments later, Sister Indica was back in the library. Vincenzo was sipping a martini and smoking a cigar. I hear you've gotten the full tour of the mansion. I sure did. And I got a chance to bond with your sister. Hopefully one day we'll be friends. So what would you like to do now? Well, Mr. Valducci, I'd love nothing more than a huge glass of vodka and one of Pandora's blunts, but instead I think I'll have some herbal tea and a nice hot bath. Only if I can join you. I wouldn't want it any other way. For the first time in a long time, Sister Indica felt like herself again. The grief and sadness had lifted and she was ready to take on the world. She got Rosie Bush out of Rogue Nun Productions. She'd moved in with her new beau, Vincenzo Valducci. And she was pregnant with his baby. She felt like celebrating, so she arranged an extravagant dinner party at the Valducci mansion. She wrote out invitations and had one of Vincenzo's butlers deliver them personally. She had also given the entire staff of Rogue Nun a week's worth of paid vacation, so that her crew would have time to undo all of Rosie Bush's awful design choices. Sister Indica draped herself in a chiffon robe, which was trimmed with feathers, and opened the balcony doors of the master suite. 
A warm breeze blew in, and she stepped outside. The gardens were in bloom, and for the first time, the mountains no longer had snow caps. The mountains, like her, had finally thawed. She breathed in the perfume of the lilac blossoms and rubbed her belly. I'm going to do my best with you, kid. I'm sure I'll make all kinds of mistakes, and you may even grow up to hate me, but you could also grow up to be a senator or a famous writer or just someone who's a really good person who makes other people's lives better. The sky's the limit. You already have a family waiting for you that loves you and will do anything for you. You're pretty damn lucky, kid. Just then, Vincenzo joined Sister Indica on the balcony, wrapping his arms around her and kissing her on the cheek. Did I just hear you talking to our baby? You sure did, Vinny. It's supposed to be good for them. Vinny got down on both knees and held Sister Indica's belly in his hands. Hey, little one. It's me, your daddy. I've done this once, and I think I did a pretty good job. I'm older now. So I may be a little slower and get tired a lot faster. Give an old man a break, okay? We are going to be amazing parents. You are going to be an amazing mother. Don't let me get all baby crazy. I want to be a cool mom. Don't let me lose my edge. (laughs) I think it's safe to say your edge isn't going anywhere. While the happy couple embraced in the morning sun, Detective Jim Brinkman was returning to work at the Misty River Police Department. As soon as he sat down at his desk, Detective Grace Kowalski was rushing into his office. Jim, oh my God, look at your head. You're hurt. I should have never let you go to the Valducci's alone. Close the door. You're upset. I know everything, Grace. What do you mean? Cut the bullshit, Kowalski. I know the Valducci's have this police department on their payroll, along with every level of government. They fucking own this town, and there's nothing I can do about it. I also know that you are on their payroll. You've been betraying me this whole time. Do you think I'm doing this because I want to? I don't have a choice. I'm being forced into it. You know how they are. If you don't do what they want, they'll start killing everyone you love. I can't take that chance. I have a family to think of. Like I said, they own this town, and I can't do shit about it. But that doesn't mean I need to keep you as my partner. I'm having you reassigned, effective immediately. Jim, you've been through a lot. Have you really thought this through? When you've been held prisoner, all you can do is think. Now get out of my office and out of my sight. Detective Kowalski left his office quietly and quickly. Jim sat there for a few moments, realizing that his job was one big charade. What justice could there be in a town this corrupt? He would make it his mission to rid Mr. River of the plague that was the Valducci family, or he'd turn in his badge. Meanwhile, at the Valducci mansion, Sister Indica was giving Vincenzo's staff instructions for the party. They went over decor, seating arrangements, entertainment, and the menu. While she was known for her extravagant affairs, tonight needed to be extra special. Once her meeting with her team ended, she sat in the library with a cup of hot tea. Giovanni walked in wearing his workout clothes, covered in sweat. Whew. So do I have to call you mommy now? Oh my god, you bitch. Not while I'm drinking. So are you going to fill me in on what's been going on? I haven't seen you in forever. Well, you set me up for a date with your father. We fell in love. He asked me to move in after knocking me up. Oh, and uh, Rosie Bush signed over all her shares to Rogue Nun Productions, so I'm the sole owner and president. How's that for the Cliff Notes version? Hold up. Wait. You're pregnant? You, Sister Indica, with child. Now that's a shocking plot twist. I know, right? What a crazy fucking year. I'm looking forward to some calm and normalcy. I think I've earned it, right? After all you've been through? Yeah. But I need to ask you, have you told my father about Lily Banks being our biological mother? Gio, I told you I'd keep it a secret. I'm a woman of my word. The only other person who knows anything is Pandora, and I trust her with my life. No one else knows that you and I are actually brother and sister. 
I don't even want to think about Benny and Mrs. Banks having sex. Ugh. You think I want to bring that up? That makes me wonder. If Vincenzo is my father, who is yours? Well, Mrs. Banks left me a box of letters. I hope whatever answers I need are in there. Things have been so crazy lately, it just hasn't been the right time for me to get into them. But I need to at some point. I have a feeling these letters are going to take me on quite an adventure. I will be there every step of the way. That's my phone. Oh, it's Pandora. Hey, lady, what's going on? You better not be calling to cancel on me. Of course I want to go shopping. Are you kidding? Yes, I think we both need new outfits for tonight. I'll meet you at Goldie's Bar in 20. And I'll invite Bianca Wolf, too. We've all got some celebrating to do. Sister Indica, Bianca Wolf, and Pandora Destrange all met up at Goldie's Bar for a drink and some shopping. Sister Indica was the last to arrive and practically floated into the room over to Pandora and Bianca's table. You're in a good mood. Who is this happy bitch? Have I met you, girl? I was about to say, I've never seen you glow so much. You're up to something, aren't you? Ladies, life is good. I haven't stepped off cloud nine since Vinny invited me to move in with him. Oh my god! That's amazing! I feel like I've been so out of the loop these days. Did you tell Bianca the other reason you're glowing so much? No, but it is one of the reasons I invited you to join us, Bianca. The first bit of exciting news? I'm pregnant. I'm so happy for you, sis. Congratulations. And my second bit of news is that Rosie Bush has left Rogue Nun Productions and has generously signed over all her shares to me. That's Incredible. That would make you the sole owner of Rogue Nun. You've never had this kind of control over the company. You can really do everything you've ever dreamed of. This is such great news. With this new power comes a lot of new responsibility. And with this baby coming, I'm going to be busy preparing for their arrival. So I'm going to need a lot of help, which is where you come in, Bianca. I want you to come back to Rogue Nun. I'd love to, but Biff Barrington is in my old position. I wouldn't want you to fire him just so I could return. I'm not firing him. As much as I hate him for what he did to me personally, he has made business boom, and you know me, I'm all business. But I don't want you to return as vice president of acquisitions. I want you as my co-president. What do you say? This is the happiest day of my life! Yes, I'm in. The ladies ordered a round of drinks, including a club soda for Sister Indica, and toasted. To an exciting future where everything is possible. To To the the future! future. Pandora put her hand on Sister Indica's stomach. You're coming at the right time, child, and you can expect to be the best-dressed kid in all of Misty River. As Pandora touched Sister Indica's stomach, she began to get a flash of images. She slowed her breath and focused, which made the images slow down so she could see them clearly. The images were cryptic, but the message she got was that something awful was going to happen to the baby not long after she was born. She. It was a girl. You know it, Pandora. Furs, diamonds, I don't care whether this is a boy or girl, this baby is getting furs and diamonds. Pandora laughed. She could never tell Sister Indica about her vision. She would just have to stay vigilant and try to stop whatever was going to happen. What good was having these powers if they couldn't be used to help her dearest friend? All right, girls. Let's do some damage. The jazz band Sister Indica hired to play the party had just set up and was starting their sound check as she was walking down the grand staircase. She was dressed in a flowing lilac gown and dripping in diamonds. There were even diamonds in the fabric of her matching turban. After she checked on the decor and met with catering, she retired to the library for a glass of champagne. Your mama is better with a buzz, kid. 
As she sipped her drink, Fiona Valducci and Dmitri Sokolov walked in. I was wondering how long it would take for you to return to your default setting of drunk whore. A glass here and there is okay. I checked. I have no intention of harming my baby. Of course you wouldn't. That would ruin your meal ticket. What are you implying, Fiona? That I got pregnant to rope Vincenzo into a relationship? All so I could have his money? Do you have any idea how fucking rich I am? The only thing a wealthy person wants is more wealth. I'm sure you're well off, but your portfolio doesn't even compare to the vast fortunes my family has. Nor have you ever had this amount of power. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. You can tell a lot about a person by how they act when they've been given a little power. You can also tell a lot about a person by the way they act when they feel threatened. Fiona, I was really hoping we'd be close. Like family. Well, think again, bitch. Well, I have a party to attend to, so if you're finished insulting me, I'll be on my way. I'm just getting started with you. Well, I'm leaving. Sister Indica finished her champagne and threw the glass dramatically into the fireplace. Be careful, Fiona. I wouldn't want you to get cut. Sister Indica turned and stormed out of the library, leaving Fiona and Dimitri alone. <sighs> We're going to destroy her, Dimitri. And my foolish brother, Vincenzo. I need them both out of the way so I can take my rightful place as head of this empire. With Vincenzo gone, Daddy would have no problem putting me in charge. As always, I am at your service. That reminds me, Dima, darling. Did you reverse Joanne's brainwashing? Well, yes and no. I could easily bring Natalia back without Joanne ever being the wiser. Oh, <laughs> you sneaky son of a bitch. That's why I keep you around, Dima. You're always one step ahead. Indeed. As Sister Indica was putting the last touches on the dinner table decor, one of the butlers announced a visitor arriving early. Thank you, darling. Send her in. Moments later, Vivian Vandele was cautiously walking into the dining room. Vivers, hi, welcome. I'm glad you can make it. I must admit, I wasn't going to accept your invitation. I mean, after I sold my shares of Rogue Nun to Rosie Bush, I didn't think you'd ever want to see Vivers again. I know what an unforgiving bitch you could be. You know what? You have every reason to be suspicious, as that it's really out of character for me to be betrayed and forgive someone. Especially this easily, but I have. I forgive you, Vivers, and I, I want to put the past behind us. Do you think that's possible? Sure, it's possible. But I sense some shenanigans at play. <laughs> at the very least, a tad of tomfoolery. Level with me, sister. What's your agenda? Some information has come to light recently. Information that will rock your world and turn it on its head. You need to take a seat. Sister Indica motioned for a butler to bring them both drinks. He returned shortly with a glass of champagne for Vivian and some club soda for Sister Indica. Well, the day of my Christmas soiree, I learned that Lily Banks was my biological mother. <gasps> oh my God! It gets wilder. Not only was she my mother, but I was born a twin. I recently learned that my long-lost twin sister is you. <laughs> Please forgive my suspicion, but this, this doesn't make any sense. If I were adopted, and I'm sure my parents would have mentioned it to me over, like, the last 40 years, I'm not going to believe we're related until I see a blood test that confirms it, okay? I'd like one myself, too, just to confirm that the information I got was true. But I need to go to the hospital anyway for an ultrasound, so maybe you can come with me. We go together, get some blood testing at the same time. Ultrasound? Are you, are you okay? I'm pregnant, which is why I'm drinking club soda. Well, that's a first. I can't recall the last time I saw you sober. Congratulations, Ma. Yes, let's both go to the hospital first thing in the morning.
Rosie sat in the formal living room of her mansion, sipping a gin and tonic and trying to process all that she'd just been through. She was still swollen and bandaged, but thanks to the private nurse she'd hired to examine her, she had plenty of painkillers. Gin and Vicodin. My favourite combination. Suddenly, Tibetan bells rang through the house. Someone was at the front door. Rosie laboured to her feet and walked for what felt like a thousand miles to the front door. She looked at the new security monitor and saw that it was Joanne, looking slovenly and unkempt. It was the old Joanne, all right. Rosie flung the doors open. Joanne, please tell me it's really you. It's me, Rosie. I'm back. I'm so sorry for everything. Can you ever forgive me? I already have, Joanne. Come inside. I have a fire going and plenty of booze. The women retired to the formal living room, drinks in hand, unable to articulate the hell they'd both experienced at the hands of the Valduches. I don't even know what to say. Except that I'm glad you're back. I wasn't sure Fiona and Dimitri would honor my request to have your brainwashing undone, but... Here you are. I can only imagine what that cost you. It cost me rogue none. But it's such a small price to pay to have you back. Plus, being at rogue none showed me that when I apply myself, I could do anything. Why should I waste my potential working with someone I hate? How am I punishing her? By making her a ton of money and fixing all of her problems? No thanks. But I have a feeling things will turn around. Christ, it's like Grand Central Station here tonight. You rest. I'll get it. Moments later, Joanne returned with talk show host Natalie Winter. Rosie! Oh my God, what happened to your face? It's a long story. Here, have a drink. Oh, thank you, darling. It just so happens that I love long stories. But if you don't want to talk about it now, we can table that for another time. I'd rather not dwell on it any more than I already am. Tell me what brings you. It's such a nice surprise having you in my home. When I saw Sister Indica's press release about your resignation from Rogue Nun Productions, I just had to come over and get the gossip from you. What happened? You were doing so well. Why would you leave at the top of your game? Sister Indica and I decided we were better at being rivals than partners. Quite frankly, her company didn't deserve me. That's putting it mildly. Rosie, what you did for the floundering rogue nun is nothing short of remarkable. You have such a gift, and rogue nun's loss will hopefully be our gain. What do you mean? Rosie, I simply must have you sitting beside me as co-president of Apollo Media Enterprises, With your understanding of rogue nuns' inner workings, bringing them to their knees will be a cakewalk. What do you say? Would you like to destroy Sister Indica together? Natalie, that's the nicest thing anyone said to me all day. I'd love to. To Sister Indica's inevitable demise. Joy Bomb with Sister Indica presents Blazed All Our Lives, The Ghost of Lily Banks. Written, produced, directed by, and starring Sister Indica. Also starring Rosie Bush, Joanne Michaels, Pandora de Stranger, featuring Stephen Bakos as Vincenzo Valducci, Divine Grace as Fiona Valducci. Freddy Prinz Charming as Detective Jim Brinkman, Dixon Dumay as Giovanni Valducci, Katie Christian Starr as Bianca Wolf, Sister Gladiola Gladrags as Dmitri Sokolov, Eve All as Dante Fox, Iva Turner as Morgana Prince, Yo Yo Blackfire as Biff Barrington, Espressa Grande as Detective Grace Kowalski. Pissy Miles as Natalie Winter, Sister Divine Ho as Ray Moyer, Taylor McCoy as Lola Moyer, Conita Asada as Bruno Costa, Chris Ashton as Dr. Victor Banks, Big Mel as Vivian Vandelay, 
Coco St. James as Ashley Costa, Go to Hell Jen as Greta Schumacher, and narrated by yours truly, Sister Bang Bang.